Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Mitchell Weiss. Mitchell is the Chief Robotics Officer at HDS Global. Mitchell, welcome to the pod. Hi, Spencer. Glad to be back. Glad to have you back. So we had a heated debate going before we uh, hit record here. We were talking about um, putting stepper motors into uh, products. Um, and I guess it probably depends on the product, but for the for the people listening, I think you are not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a fan. Yeah, I've used them plenty, and in fact, at at PRI programmation, we had stepper motors driving our vehicles, but that's essentially because they're 50 pole brushless motors, and that's good to use in the clean room. Oh, that's but, interesting. Yeah, because you don't have graphite going everywhere. Yeah, but and it was before brushless motors were ubiquitous. So now everything's a brushless DC, right? Makes but, sense. Even then, in the early days of selling robots in the semiconductor industry, there was a company called Intellidex. And Intellidex had their robots, and they were all stepper motor driven. And it was connected to a PC, and they were all very high techy guys. And I remember talking to the CTO of Intellidex or one of the founders, and I was like, like stepper motors, who does that? <laughs> and he was like, we do. And I say, well, let me tell you what's wrong with stepper motors and robots. He says, there's nothing wrong. I know everything about robots. I worked at HP on printers. Nice. Yeah. And so they use stepper motors in their robots. I would say that's a valid them. use case, though. If you can cut the cost of an encoder on like a $30 printer. Well, and in a printer, you don't have variable inertias that's true it's fixed so you, you don't have to carriage. worry about the changes agreed and so in a robot the inertia changes all over the place and yeah you know, no stepper motors articulated robot no <laughs> the entry robot maybe my 3d printer has stepper motors on it and i have to make sure i close the door and shut the curtains on its little thermal chamber so it doesn't wake anyone up in the house <laughs> some of them lean into that right i mean like some of the 3d printers will play a song through the motors oh lovely yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was it a is it a honda commercial a vw commercial where they put the bumps in the road and they drove a tune they they played a tune by driving the car at a constant speed over the bumps in the road i didn't see this one that sounds awesome though Oh, it's great. Yeah. I'm kind of reminded of the uh, the episode of Top Gear where they played, um, I think it was Jessica by the Allman Brothers, by just two, like getting recordings of different exhaust sounds. There you <laughs> so, go. Yeah, it was fun. But then you got in pace. This was like physically done on the road. They took a mile of the road and they put all these bumps in it. It was like, uh, what is it, a music box. Right, the little cams, yeah, tickling the fingers. Except it was the tires of the car going over the bumps in the road. <laughs> That's awesome. That must have taken some doing to get that right. Hey, it's it's TV, it's commercials. They spend money on commercials. They could have fixed it in post, and you would never know with that. Like if it didn't work, I feel like you know you just yeah, pretty low risk, I guess. You insert a digital effect here. <laughs> What have you been up to lately? Any any interesting projects? Well, yeah, that's an easy one. We've been working on this new design of systems for order fulfillment. And downstairs here, I'm not at home this time. Last time we talked, I was working at home. This time I'm working in my office. I own a little building. Nice. And uh, downstairs in the office, we're building a 
storage retrieval system with four robot arms on it and all kinds of cool stuff. That sounds really fun. That that thing is coming together. Uh, hopefully by Christmas it'll be fully operational. And we'll be tuning her up. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Give me something to do. Yeah. And I'm getting lots of exercise. Now, I was jokingly going to say, are you, are you working Christmas? But, of course, we're Jews, and it's Hanukkah, and we're both working right now. <laughs> we're recording yeah, we always wear Hanukkah. Yeah. I used to volunteer at hospitals on Christmas, but I don't do that anymore. I'm not a good person anymore. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm trying to get this thing done before Christmas. I've got three of my guys flying in from around the country to work on it the week before, next week, so that I don't have to keep them working through Christmas. Nice. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I've worked plenty of uh plenty of holidays in the past. I'm finally taking it off this year, which is nice. Uh, I have spent way too many New Year's doing inventories. And of course, customers always appreciate if you're working during their Christmas and New Year's shutdown. Yep. And they're Stop. willing to give you that year on spend if you do. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Got to spend all this money. <laughs> we won't get as much next year. I remember I, I was at Intel in New Mexico. Albuquerque. Is that Albuquerque? I don't know. One of the Intel fabs in New Mexico. And we were putting together this robot wet bench. It was the first robotic wet bench in Intel. What's a wet, wet bench? bench. Wet bench is where you etched the wafers. Got it. In the good old days, you did it with nasty, nasty chemicals, phosphoric, hydrofluoric, and sulfuric acid. What do they and use now? Plasma. Nice. Yeah. Now it's all dry etch. So much safer. Um, but back then, it was all wet etch. So you would literally dunk the wafers in a tank of sulfuric acid and then dunk them in water to stop it. And if you wanted to etch the silicon, the glass, you had to do it in hydrofluoric and phosphoric was for cleaning. And if you mix the two, God help you run like hell. <laughs> it's terrible stuff. So we did this first robot for them. This was back US robot days for automating this dunking in the wet bench. And I'm there trying to make it work and we're having all kinds of trouble because the electronics that they're using for the tank timers isn't properly designed for the high static environment in a clean room. Clean rooms turn out to be very dry. So a clean room in the desert is especially dry. <laughs> and uh, the wet benches were made out of polypropylene. Makes sense. And every time you got out of your chair with your nylon bunny suit and touched anything, there'd be a spark and the timers would go bad. So the guys at Intel decided that was going to be my problem, not the guy who built the timers because I was automating the wet bench. So off to Radio Shack, buy a bunch of MOVs and slaughter them all over the place. Regardless, my plan then, and I didn't do it much and I still haven't done it much. But my plan on this particular trip was I wanted to drive up to Los Alamos on Saturday. So I, you know, booked my trip and planned to come home on a Sunday instead of the end of the week. So I could go up to Los Alamos and see the Trinity site, right? Go to Alamo Gordo. Pretty cool. And I'm there working on this bench and, you know, fixing all this crap and the guy from intel comes to me on friday and he says so you're staying through the weekend until it works right fuck <laughs> brutal so never been there never got to see the trinity site <laughs> no no yeah, that's rough another thing on the bucket list i'll have to do someday i'm sure my wife is very excited about like going to new mexico to see where they blew up a bomb <laughs> never happened. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines.
They solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. You ever hallucinate from sleep deprivation? No, I don't think so. Only once for me. Um, it was after three days, and my entire field of vision turned to like a fractal. It was it was interesting. <laughs> That's a lot yeah. of sleep. Yeah, three that, days. It only happened once in my life. <laughs> I stayed up till four Sunday morning. I was working on something. And, you know, you get into a design, you just plug and plug and plug. And when I got out of the chair at four in the morning to drag my ass to my bedroom, I couldn't keep my balance. It was absolutely stunning. My legs just said, no, man, we went to sleep two hours ago. I don't know about <laughs> you, but we ain't working right now. <laughs> Brutal. I'm I'm guessing you uh you made it through that because you're here. So. Not 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 quite as good as I was when I was in college, but yeah, you make it I had it right. Yeah, I I've not pulled an all nighter for a while, but I pulled a lot back in the day. Like I think in my life, like easily a thousand, you know. But nope, uh, yeah. uh-uh. nope. I no, won't sir. anymore. <laughs> Nope, didn't do that. Apparently, Kevin Dowling used to do them, is, is what I heard. Like when he was in college, like way before. Yeah. Much of my dad's cousin was his teacher, so I think we all did. I think I mean, if you go to MIT yeah. or Carnegie Mellon, yeah. like you, you end up staying up all night, you know. Yeah, and there were plenty of times. Yeah. There was, a, we had the, the design class where you have to build things and you have the contest and everything. Yeah. Yep. In in my day, that was the first half of the semester. Oh, cool. Half of the semester you worked on real engineering stuff. (laughs) And so we had a design uh, gastrointestinal pump that someone could wear and walk around. Is that to like like colostomy? colostomy No, no, a feeding pump. Okay, got it. And so some of the students, and this is one that, huge downsides of going to MIT is there's some really smart people there and you feel like a piece of crap. When yeah, you're I know the feeling. <laughs> so some of them design these clever things that use the energy from your walking to power it and all that stuff. But I had worked with ball screws and designed some machinery already. So I had this little pump that you wore on your hip and it had a stainless screw that drove a piston back and forth to slowly feed you Okay. battery pack. And I was working all night the night before getting the drawings done because in those days, if you were a mechanical engineer, you had this thing called a pencil and a drafting board. It'll never work. And a T square, see the T square (laughs) on here. And, and you made your drawings. So I'm up to like four or five in the morning and I, get my whole package together and everything. And I put the drawing in the tube. And I, I'll take a nap. And of course, the deadline was new. Like 1130, I wake up. Oh, no. Oh, no. How fast can I run over and get this thing turned in? <laughs> no. That's the downside of all-nighters. This well, it sounds like cool. the drawing was due, but it sounds like also... Um... Like you didn't have to turn in a thing made off to off the print, right? No, no, okay. you didn't have. God knows we didn't have thirty minutes to turn a <laughs> part. That's something a software engineer might think is feasible. Yeah, well, I'm having fun building this prototype here that we're doing. I got downstairs. I have a little shop. I've got a little milling machine, and I've been um, sooner or later I gotta get my hands on a lathe. And lots of power tools and hand tools. Nice. Electronics workstations. And and I've been just like knocking crap out. That's and awesome. Oh, yeah, let's modify this thing. And then the shipments have been coming in. Stuff is ridiculous. It's, I've got a drive-in door. I don't have a loading dock. So I get these huge shipments of steel parts. You know, tons, literally tons of steel showing up to the building. And I'm here by my lonesome. <laughs> I get my little pallet jack out to the truck. I have a little lift truck. 
and unload the things from the truck, but they were shipped so badly that the pallets are falling apart. You know, <laughs> and just stuff. But we got some. I got some twenty foot long, twenty two foot long extrusions. Came on the back of a fifty foot truck. Nice. Nine stop from Toronto. So just outside Toronto is the extruder. I think I drove here overnight, slept, you know, with a truck stop somewhere for a couple hours and pulled in here. As you do. Instead of backing in, he pulled in forward, which was not smart. The 53 foot trailer. And I have to get this 24 foot long pallet off the back of a 53 foot trailer with a stacker truck. Nice. It has four foot long forks on it. Brutal. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> this is from the side, I'm guessing, is like the only way you'd be able no, to do that. You can't take it from the side because you gotta get out the ass end of the truck. So what you do is you get the pallets under you get the forks into the pallet, and then you have to strap the thing to the back of the forks. Interesting. So it's cantilevered out there. So you have to sort of bend the forks up in order to have that cantilevered arch. Well, no, the cantilevered arch, it was interesting. As I'm pulling it off the truck, I, I, I only had enough lift to get a few feet above the bed of the truck because I have a short stacker. <laughs> and uh, so I'm pulling it off the truck, and I'm wondering, when it comes off the tail of the truck, will it bend all the way down and hit the ground? The answer is no, it did not. Nice. <laughs> and then the fun was getting the guy who pulled the 53-foot trailer in forward to the loading spot out back into the street. Yeah, that seems tricky, like to not to not to not jackknife at all. How wide was the garage? Well, the garage is or, he he didn't come into the garage. He just drives up beside it. But the problem I had was there were cars parked at the end of the lane. So he only had a narrow space to get out, and he had to turn it around in a two-lane road. Oh, geez. With traffic. So I'm out there stopping traffic, and he's backing it up and then giving up and trying again. So I have to <laughs> let traffic go. I have to stop traffic. I have to let traffic go. It was interesting. But now I tell all the, the semis that are showing up here, I send them pictures and, and drawings, and I say, back in. Back in, it'll be easier to get out. Nice. Yeah. Except for that guy. They've all been pretty good at it, too. Pretty good <laughs> trucks in here. Did you tell that guy, or I'm guessing this is what started the policy? Well, I told him when he was pulling up. You know, they phoned me. Hey, I can't find your building. Well, where the hell are you? Uh, I'm right in front of it. No, you're not. I'm standing here. Yeah, he was three addresses down the street in front of another building. So I get out to the road, and I wave him in, and I'm telling him to back in, and he just pulls it. Ah, ah, that's rough. <laughs> Pay attention, man. Pay attention. Yeah. But it was interesting. Empty trailer. Just just two loads on it. Holy cow. That service, man. I love extrusions. Yeah. Love Is this a custom extrusion, I'm guessing, if you had to get yeah. them from a shop in Toronto, you know? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're building a giant storage retrieval system. Not that we call it a storage retrieval system. And the center tower, some people would call it stacker crane, but we don't. We call it the tower robot. It's a 20-foot high robot made out of three aluminum extrusions. So it's super stiff and super light. Oh, cool. It's spectacular. When it's all ready for public consumption, we'll let everyone see it. Yeah, I'd be curious to, uh, to get a look at the latest prints or I guess maybe yeah. the thing itself. It's very cool. That sounds and awesome. And we're making our own trays. You know, we store all the goods in trays. So, you know, all the good companies that make these things make their own trays. Well, I don't like paying other people 20 or $30 for a tray. So we've got our own trays molded and we have them shipped from China. Getting a bigger shipment in end of the year, beginning of next year. Next year, we'll start shipping them by a container load, save some money. Nice. But, you know, we got our trays. Our shelving is all injection molded. So it all snaps into flat pieces of sheet metal. 
That's it's just awesome. a really cheap way to build the thing, and it's really, um, it went together really nice. It was a lot, it was harder physically to do than I thought, but it worked out better than we hoped for in the beginning. That's great. And it's just crazy cheap to build. That's awesome. So then I'm assuming you probably spent a decent amount on mold tooling, but you're just going to recoup it on quantity. Yeah. Well, the nice thing is, and this I learned working at PFF, you can get tooling made in China pretty cheap. You can get parts molded in China pretty cheap. You can get stuff machined in China pretty cheap. So all our machine parts come out of China. All our molded parts come out of China. Nice. Turn, turnaround is great. I can get a tool made and get sample parts in four weeks. That ain't bad at all. And I mean, those shelf brackets, they cost me 75 cents a piece. That's it. That's it. Plus the tooling cost, which was puny. Nice. Um, so the trays, it cost me just as much to ship them as it cost to make them. <laughs> wild but that was because you know the first hundred i shipped air and wanted to see how it worked out for yeah so you minutes. really are going to save money when you start just uh doing those by sea then it sounds like yeah 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 you do a container load containers are still running under five or six thousand bucks nice. so you container you ship it it used to be like three thousand bucks uh but COVID just screwed everything up in the shipping markets that's interesting that the the prices stayed high even after things kind of went back to normal. Yeah, they not quite as high. I mean, they went completely crazy. You were buying container space on on a spot market during COVID. That's interesting. But the prices really went up, and they stayed up, and they're going to stay up now. The pressure here, you know, a big part of the cost is unloading the boat shipping the container cross country on a truck or on a train or whatever and if you've noticed we're starting to pay people what they're worth yeah and get away with paying a guy 14 bucks an hour anymore to do stuff yeah nobody wants to work for 14 bucks an hour yeah well i think the minimum wage in pa if i'm not mistaken is still like under eight bucks an hour yeah but like nobody makes that much like i mean maybe if you're like working at a mcdonald's but you know, I don't have anything against Bill Morgan McDonald's. Just that's what I understand they pay. McDonald's is around here is paying fourteen, fifteen dollars an hour. Wow! Because that's what it takes to get them. If you watch uh, John Oliver, he did a story on the Dollar Store and Dollar General a couple of weeks ago. You're the second one to tell me there was a good thing on John Oliver recently today. I might yeah. actually have to start watching that. That that's like a, that's a place that would pay people eight bucks an hour. There are actually Dollar General stores that have one person working in the store, and their job is to handle all the inventory, all the checkout, all the security, everything. So you figure that's a place where they're paying people four or five bucks an hour because <laughs> they don't care about them. Yeah, it was quite the. It was interesting to watch. He, he's got interesting stuff to say. Yeah. Although, Even I mean, with Dollar General, I mean, your margin's got to be, like, I mean, I don't know. Like, I can't imagine it's great, but it's a giant. Well, giant margins so. are awful, but the company's doing great. But their people are treated like crap. That's And they give impossible tasks to do. Right? Yeah. What else is news? Touche. <laughs> Companies do that. Yeah. Yeah, they, they a lot of them do. And, and I know socialist or anything but uh you got to do better sometimes yeah yeah for sure i try to pay people pretty well i mean i i think like, the lowest paid person at ska makes 25 bucks an hour so right. hopefully they don't listen to this episode and find out yeah yeah we were paying less than that at sea rig years ago for our techs on the floor. Um, yeah, it's tough to get good ones when you do yeah, that. Our techs make a decent amount more than that. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if I'm overpaying people. <laughs> but... Oh, there is something you said about 
inflation. Um, I'm reasonably convinced that a lot of the engineers in the valley, uh, let's bring this back to robotics. So you got all these Silicon Valley robotics companies and they're all gonna solve the world's problems with AI. And you can think of the three or four companies I'm thinking about. Yep. They have these very high priced people working or running reinforcement learning systems to teach their robot how to grip something instead of sitting down, figuring out what the basic principles are and working it out. I don't think they're all going to succeed because I think their payrolls are outrageous. And I think they don't chase the fundamentals of their business very well. It's going to be interesting to watch. Oh, I see what you're talking about. So just these companies like burning money on these far out projects. Yeah. Or trying to solve robot problems that are fundamental problems with, oh, well, AI will fix that. We'll schedule that. It, it we'll is an fix. interesting thing, though, because if you do get that to work, it's pretty amazing. But I if mean, you I'm... get it to work and the whole reason for doing it is when you have a fantastically changing environment. Yep. You need that kind of thing that can tune and tweak itself. But well, if I someone... think the other idea is just removing the setup costs. Like if you didn't have to have a programmer on site, I mean, would be like the value prop. But I mean, I don't think we're there yet either. I have heard that one a lot for a long time, right? That was the whole thing behind Baxter and Rethink Robotics was reduce the setup cost. Oh, you have to hire engineers. Set up. What happened to them? Oh, yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> it didn't last that long. It didn't last that long. Once the robot's running is when it's making your money. Yep. Yeah. That's a good point. So if you I, if you prolong setup by having it have to fumble around or you break something in the same well, way. Well, it's to slow it down, right? And that's the other thing. Everyone who's getting into the market, getting into the business using robots is using a collaborative robot. Right. I'll oh, we'll use a UR robot or something that runs ROS or whatever. Well, those robots are slower. Yep. Yeah. By necessity. <laughs> yeah. So how about we keep the people out of the factory so we can run the factory faster? The guys who are making bullets and pills and Hershey's kisses don't want slow robots. <laughs> They want fast robots. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to use a slow robot with anything like that. Like you said, like commodity items. Yeah. So. I mean, the automotive people don't really use, you know, cobots either. They sort of do. They say they do. Like I, I, I was in an automotive plant not too long ago where they were using uh, sick area scanners with a FANUC arm and they called it a cobot. I'm like, all right. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> you know, like. Fair enough. Yeah. 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 We were doing work. We were talking to a lot of people in secret days about using the stereo cameras to do cobotics, you know, safe areas. But it, it, it's a very slippery slope to get on when you start dealing with human safety. Look what happened to Cruz, right? Oh, we're going to use AI for all this stuff. Oh, and then we're going to run over a lady and drag her across the streets of San Francisco. <laughs> So now Cruz has completely shut down and they're laying people off and the head of Cruz is gone and Barry Barra has to spin another story for the billions of dollars they spent on it. Yeah, yeah that was uh, that was pretty brutal to watch. I Did you watch it? I didn't watch well, it. I didn't watch the video. I meant like to, to hear yeah. about it as it was happening um, in the media from people. Not as it was happening, but you know, as the aftermath yeah. unfolded yeah and and you knew it was coming if you're running a detector that's trained on ai it's not going to be fail safe it's going to be pretty good yep pretty good doesn't count yeah that's an interesting uh way of looking at it so like in any safety critical system I mean, that's kind of where it gets you because there's going to be that, you know, whatever percent that doesn't work. Yeah, and uh, and the percentage of how well it works is super dependent on what your 
learning set is, right? Yep. Your training set. So if your training set didn't include women who look like that woman, you're not going to see her. My understanding, and, and maybe you studied it closer than me, was that she was under the car. So she was kind of away from like where any sensor could see her and nobody built in the ability to infer, you know, if something, if somebody disappears all of a sudden, they might be under the car and therefore stop. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't. So it was a blind spot. Like it, they couldn't see that. A blind spot before it hit her. Probably she... not. Yeah. I think she was, she was there and then she wasn't from the car's perspective. Right. And so the code says, okay, it's all clear. That's my understanding, or I, I think it. Uh, what what was described to me, and again, I could be wrong on this. I haven't studied it in depth, but it was that the car had a heuristic where it tried to pull over because it was in an accident, and in pulling over, it dragged this woman. Uh, and, you know, mangled her pretty bad. It, it, it was a pretty long drag, from what I read. But regardless, I worry about people skipping steps analytical steps because the computer can figure it out and never been a fan of that yeah so when i joined hds part of the engineering mantra was well we use ai to do this scheduling and we'll use ai to do that scheduling and we'll be able to optimize this thing and we'll be able to optimize that thing and I set a bunch of design rules down, and one of them was, we're going to make the equipment as fast as we can because we can't count on AI to solve our problems. <laughs> so instead of trying to optimize all the routing and all the movement and all the, there's a thing called, um, I don't know, what are they called? It's not adjacent suits. Uh, It sucks to get old. When you buy ketchup, you often buy mustard. Oh, interesting. When you buy peanut butter, you often buy jelly. So they're affinities, they're called. That makes sense. So you want to sort with affinities. Interesting, yeah, because then you don't have to shuttle as far to get to the, right. the other item. Yeah. When you really dig into the statistics of the 100,000 SKUs you might be dealing with, the number of times you get a win out of those affinities is maybe five picks a day. Oh, interesting. So, so it's not yeah, significant. You can pick a lot faster if you've got the right affinity set up. Oh, it is significant. No, but uh -huh. the, the distribution of goods that people buy and goods you have in inventory is a long-tailed Gaussian curve. Okay. And your affinities are way at the end of that tail. Your affinities are way at the front for your fast movers. But most of your work is the long tail. Oh, that's interesting. So you start to say, okay, yeah, well, if, if we've got the right affinities, we can get two picks for every tray or three picks for every tray. So we only have to bring a tray every third part. Well, no, that only works for like 2% of the picking you're doing. So that was an example of here's the throughput we're going to need from the robots because we're going to get three picks per tray. But when you go look at the stats, it really works out to about 1.01 picks per tray because those affinities happen so infrequently. The more SKUs you have in your product line, the more your customer. Look at Amazon, right? You buy something from Amazon. How often does Amazon get to deliver in any day two things, you know, peanut butter and jelly that go together? Oh, I see. That's you know, usually not it. Usually you get a box with one thing in it from Amazon. Yeah. And usually you're ordering like, oh, crap, I'm out of. You know, butter. batteries for something. So you yeah. order one thing from Amazon. So that's most of what the business is. So if you look at the Instacart data and the Amazon data and everything else, it was huge, long tails of, you know, very few picked 
of these items, but you have so many of those items, it's most of what your picking is. <laughs> so you're fast movers. So like what Walmart's doing with Alert in their little micro fulfillment centers is they're limiting it to like 3,000 SKUs. Well, that's interesting. So odds are good, they'll get picked off it. Yeah. But odds are also good, they'll get a tiny customer base that's using that a lot and still has to go into the physical store or get online or do something to fill out their business. So the idea is that you can only order so much and the rest of it you just have to buy because it's not yeah. stocked on the online store. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... think of Costco, right? Classic example. Everyone who goes to Costco, like me, loves yeah, me Costco. Too. But how many SKUs does Costco have? You go for a ton. You go for a few things every few weeks, right? Oh, we're going to buy some. They have great salmon. They yep. have, you know, don't buy their meat and their chicken. Although if I wanted Wagyu beef, I guess I'd buy it at Costco for a thousand bucks. The chicken I've been burned by so many times at Costco. I feel like I've got, I um, I've gotten it and then I've had to return it. Like just way too many times i'm still keeping some short ribs in my chest freezer that i need to return to costco where i feel like maybe i should throw those out but it's like 36 bucks and i'm like if i remember that <laughs> and get 36 bucks back next time i go to costco my wife buys her asiago cheese there oh yeah they have good asiago cheese there i buy their three pound bags of pistachios yeah those are good too you know, I still have to go to CVS and I still have to go to the local grocery store. Yeah, you can't buy certain stuff there, that's for sure. That's right. So, do get drugs there, though. They're very good with drugs. I pharmacy, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't realize they had a they had a pharma, pharmacy there. Oh, yeah. I got my shingle shot there years ago. Oh, that's ago. cool. Hi, maybe I should start going to the Costco pharmacy. Um, yeah, well, it depends on your health insurance and your pharmacy and who treats what better. I when I was should... buying stuff to keep this beautiful mane of mine. <laughs> Jealous. One of the, so I use two pharmaceutical products to keep this stuff growing, right? Nice. I one, of them was, that. one of them was Propecia, right? Um Finast no, yeah, I think it's finasterid. So insurance doesn't cover it. So I bought that at Costco because they were the cheapest place to get. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, non-covered pharmaceuticals get pretty pricey. So it's awesome. And if it's for something as vain as growing my hair, yeah, you know, why bother? Yeah, I mean, you know, it sounds like you'd want to keep your hair, and I don't blame you as someone that doesn't have any. So. I, went, I went to see one of those guys, you know, the guys who advertise on TV. Come in for a free assessment. Blah, 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 blah. So there's a couple of them in Boston who are pretty big. So I went to see one. And they do the whole hour intake thing and they explain the whole male, male pattern baldness. And they talk about all the treatments they can offer you. You know, and they're hoping none of them work so they can transplant one hair at a time. But, charge you a report. I'm just trying to get a script, right? So I go in there and they say, yeah, you can try Rogaine. You can try Propecia. We can, we'll write you a, a script for it. And, uh, but you know, if it doesn't work and come back and we'll plant some hair there. Great. So <laughs> here's your scripts. Come back in six months, whatever. So I go back in six months and I go see the guy. I could see the doctor because it's a follow-up. Not seeing the intake guy. And he says, so why are you here? Well, because you told me to come in after six months. Yeah. Ah, you're doing great. You're a freaking walking advertisement for these uh, <laughs> ph pharmaceutical hair growth. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Glad it worked. I think I my parents got me the Rogaine when I was in high school, <laughs> hilariously enough. That's how bad uh, it was with me. Um, and yeah, I, that, I that's just probably barely, hard to stem the tide on. Yeah, I barely used it. I, I, I don't know. I was just like, this is stupid. I'm a kid. I don't think I'm going bald. And then 
there was this little spot in the back that like nobody told me about. Like I was paying a guy to cut my hair. Well, I mean, yeah, I was, yeah, I was going to this haircut place, and he never told me. I had to find it. I had my friends had to tell me. I was like, oh, I'm going bald. <laughs> So. I I started figuring out I was bad on on video conference calls because you know I bend over like this and then see it in the screen and go oh oh that's getting thin I better <laughs> deal with that yeah. so I got lucky I nipped it in the bud nice yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I think I'm uh, like balder than George Carlin, who I learned about baldness from when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, it's just it is what it is. It's a it's a foregone conclusion at this point. Yep. I thought about trying to go to like Turkey and get hair plugs, and I might someday or get them done here or wherever. But um, I don't know. I'm kind of enjoying just letting it go and seeing work. And like if I get the transplants, I'll have like a receding middle hairline too. So. I figure, yeah. you know, I'm probably better off just letting myself get completely bald and then doing it, you know? <laughs> yeah, or not doing it at all. And yeah, just, or just, just let it roll. Yeah, exactly. Like a book, yeah. Just don't get a bad toupee, you know? That's, yeah, that's like I think I would do hair plugs before I did a toupee. Because then everyone's, like, in the meeting. I was uh I was watching a Three Stooges the other day where um there's this gag where they pull the guy's toupee off and then Mo goes oh look a tarantula and then he's like stomp on it and they're all like stomping on this guy's toupee and then a bailiff comes around and they grab his gun and shoot at the toupee six times <laughs> it's totally destroyed and the guy puts it back on and just kind of mad at him so uh, I feel like that's always gonna be funny bullet hole in his toupee yep hmm. So we're like way off the topic of robotics, <laughs> but I'm enjoying the human experience regardless. If we're if we're talking about the Three Stooges and we're talking about robotics, we can always talk about Metropolis. What's that? That's uh, Fritz Lang's movie, the first movie with a robot in it. Sounds Silent like I gotta watch this. I'm gonna add this to my weekend oh, list. You haven't watched Metropolis? No, not yet. Talk to Kevin. I'm sure he knows where to get the best copy. Yeah. It's yeah. I think when I worked for Unimation, we actually screened it at work once. But there's a new um, version of it. They re whatever the fancy word is for renewing a film, and added some sections in that disappeared and everything else. Oh, cool. So you know, it's it's the typical silent movie era robot story you know the serfs live underground working hard to serve the rich people who live on the surface of the earth and and they build this robot maria and uh she learns of the suffering of the serfs you know tries to deal with it uh yeah, you know, it's social commentary on on the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, it makes sense. It's a it's a great film, and if you look at the imagery in the film, you know it's very reminiscent of early New York City kind of skylines, all those kind of noir kind of looks. That's cool. It's it's very cool. You got to see Metropolis. If you're a robot guy, you have to watch Metropolis. It sounds like it. So it's a silent film. So it was made in like the 1920s. Yeah. Cool. Yep. You have to check it out. You should definitely check it out. Yeah, I just watched that. What's what's that Ann Rand one? It was like um, Fountainhead. Fountainhead. That was kind of interesting. I didn't see the film. The tried to read the book. <laughs> yeah, I mean her books are pretty pretty lengthy to say the least. But I, I did think the um the film was kind of interesting, you know. A little little caricaturish at times, but I mean they definitely had that noir look kinda of going on and Yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting interesting concept at least. I I'm rereading Player Piano. Kurt Vonnegut's Player Piano, which is commentary on robots and 
and the Industrial Revolution and all that. So you have two sides of the river and a company very reminiscent of GE in Schenectady when its headquarters were in Schenectady. <laughs> and it's in upstate New York is where the story takes place. And uh, yeah, you've got the engineers who run the factories and you've got the workers who were put out of work who now hang out in the bars. And I read that when I was in college. And I remember riding the elevator at the AI lab at MIT with Bert Horn, who was my sponsor, so to speak, there, and talking to him. I said, everybody in the robot business should have to read player piano. Oh, that's interesting. And and uh, the Boston Repertory Theater, which is now the American Repertory in Harvard or something, I don't know. But they put on a play they made out of player piano. That's so cool. It was just super lucky for me that this book written 10, 20 years before I read it was now being turned into a play in Boston and I could read it and talk to professors at the AI lab about it and stuff. <laughs> so I'm rereading that book. It's a pretty easy read. That sounds good. I'll have to check that out. So Metropolis and player piano are my, my assignments yeah. after this. Are your assignments for today. Yeah. Books, every, books and movies every robot fan should, should know. Yeah. I asked someone once. Well, the guy who was president of Secret had never read iRobot. I told him he had to. So I gave him a copy of it, which he still didn't read. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the number of people, young people coming into the robot industry today who have not read iRobot just stuns me. Or I'll say to people I worked at Unimation, they'll say, oh, who was that? Uh, that was the first robot company. So I guess I'm just a crotchety old guy, but it, it surprised <laughs> me that people work in the industry and not try to learn what was known. To be honest, I'm embarrassed to say I don't think I've read iRobot yet. I might have read it as a kid. I'm like trying to remember if I, if I ever did. But I don't think it's I've read a whole lot of Asimov. It's what got me into the business. It was, I was 15 in high school and I was reading iRobot at the time. I was reading everything Asimov wrote, and Arthur C. Clarke and Ray Bradbury. They were my ABC. And uh, so I was reading iRobot and one of my classmates dropped a poster on my desk, uh, Metro Toronto Science Fair, enter the Metro Toronto Science Fair. And I said, yeah. Maybe I'll build a robot and enter the science fair. <laughs> so that's how I got started. So I built my first robot when I was 15, which is now over 50 years ago. Nice. And entered it in the Metro Toronto Science Fair and did that for three years. What did you build? Like what, what type of robot was it? Well, the first miserable thing I built was galvanized steel and a couple of wheels and a couple of cranes hanging from its arms and a little control panel. And it was terrible and uh, didn't quite work. And then the next year, I built a much better machine. It's about three and a half feet tall, a couple of arms on it and wheels and an ergonomic control panel and uh, obstruction sensor. I made nice. an obstacle sensor out of a piece of PVC pipe the parabolic reflector of a flashlight, a photo cell and a transistor. And so it would see the reflection and based on what angle it was at would turn in the opposite direction. Oh, cool. So you could drive the thing up to a wall and it would turn away. But at the science fair, which was held at the Ontario Science Center, which was a big complex in Toronto, the science fair was held in a giant atrium of this place that had floor to ceiling windows that were a hundred feet tall. It didn't work. It oh, brutal. My sunlight. You got washed out. <laughs> but but the judges appreciated it. So I got a couple of awards for that machine. Um, I got a, a engineering design award from the University of Toronto and I got a second place or third place prize 
And then the next year I entered again, and now I had a robot that was six feet tall. <laughs> and had two articulated arms on it. And of course it was, and could bend at the waist. And all the drives were electric motors, fishing line, and pulleys. Oh, that's cool. And it's the a total were, clean sheet design. Yeah. And the pulleys were the tops of Minute Maid orange juice cans. Nice. Yeah. That's what you do yeah. when you're that old. <laughs> yeah. So you take half the pulley off the can, but you take the top off the can. And if you solder two of them together, you got a pulley. <laughs> that's awesome. So, and then, yeah, you know, oh, if you play with ropes in a lot of directions, you can build a lot of things. How would you solder a, a Minute Maid orange juice can? Just plastic uh, melting, or were they use metal? No, I use solder. They used metal. The ends of the cans were metal, and the bodies were cardboard. But you could so get solder it, to adhere to that. Yeah, the metal. Sand the metal and solder the, the metal. Nice. I don't know. It was just ten. Solder works. Yeah, that does on that. That's awesome. So, you know, the the thing was made out of PVC tubing, and so lots of time with the Dremel tool, carving out the little curves so you could do the joints, and breathing PVC dust and finding <laughs> out that was a thing to do a year after that, and a you know, plastic skin for the framework so the skeleton was made out of pvc and the plastic skin was some fiberglass for outdoor use and one of the arms had seven degrees of freedom so it had a shoulder two degrees of freedom and an elbow and a forearm and a hand and the hand was balsa wood and brass tubing and kleenex tissue and a playtex glove and it could open and close where did the kleenex tissue come in it padded the fingers. Oh, nice. Okay. So, uh, you know, you push enough buttons, it could lift its hand and reach out to shake your hand. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and the argument for this thing was, because it was so terribly impractical, was this would be used as a platform for testing human prostheses in household situations. Right, you could put a prosthetic arm on it, yeah, and it test the functionality of the arm. Because you know the two previous robots I built were small and special built, and so I couldn't go to the science fair the third year and say, "Now I'm building a freaking humanoid." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I had it on the display table. I had a you know one twelve scale little human skeleton. And a one twelve scale model of the robot. Oh, nice! You could see the fit, right? So here's the natural thing. Now I was working with my chemistry teacher in high school. We were trying to show um, nerve conduction, so I could pitch that. Yeah, you can build these prostheses and you know tie them in biologically and control them by sending signals down the nerves. But we couldn't get it to work. We bought a nerve. You got a nerve. Uh, you could buy these rabbit nerves or something. That oh, an actual cool. one. That's interesting. Yeah. And then we tried to get signals up and down it with a scope, and there was too much noise. So we built a plastic chamber with window screen and everything to give it a noise-free environment, but just didn't have a good enough scope to get the signal out of it. I would imagine like the nerve would start dying too after a while, or you wouldn't be able to run those. Yeah, but anymore. apparently they're still good at conducting signals, even though they're huh. dead. That's interesting. Just tissue, but eventually, you know, you take it out of the formula, and eventually the tissue just yeah it makes sense. The crapper, but we didn't have a good enough scope in my high school. Yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. Get the signal. So it was always the other kids, you know, I went to this Jewish parochial school. The other kids went to the public schools, you know, and they're pulling in with their equipment and their lasers and all the other crap. <laughs> oh, wow, that's really cool. Yeah. So. That's awesome. Anyhow, you know, how yeah. the hell did it get there? I was going to talk about my first robot, but I didn't have to. 
I robot. That's how we yeah. got there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you read that, and then you decided to build these three things. That's all. Yep. I decided I wanted to go in the robot business. I told him at MIT when I got there, and I was going to be a double E, and it was too hard to fit robot classes in if you were a double E, even though that was the department they offered. There were two classes on robotics at the Institute in 1975. There was Bert Horn's class, Making Machines See and Feel, which was a machine vision and kinematics course. And there was Michael Dertuzos' class, uh, which was only offered every other year. And to be able to take that class last semester, senior year, you'd have to take all these prereqs that you would only be taking double E classes. Ah. And way too much math. And so I went to the institute and said, hey, I want to work in robotics, but I think I should get some mechanical engineering under my belt. Yeah, makes sense. And, uh, so I have to be able to not take some of the required double E classes to which they said, yeah, no chance. <laughs> but, but if you want to go into the ME department, we'll let you do anything you want. Yeah. Okay. But we have to warn you, we don't think you'll ever find a job. That's all right. I'll teach you something. <laughs> so. I took my classes in control theory and machine design and electrical engineering. It's a free for all kind of mashup. And I went into the robot business. And I'm still getting paid for it. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so there wasn't I a robotics major when I did my undergrad either, even though it was much, much later than 1975. Um, I had to study computer science and business, but before that, I was engineering undecided. Was <laughs> was the one they let you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was uh, my degree is bachelor of science as recommended by the Department of Mechanical Engineering, because it's not a bachelor of science in mechanical engineering. Because I took too many classes that weren't mechanical engineering classes. But they technically still let you get it and endorsed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they let you get the degree, and oh. you know, it's an unspecified degree. That's okay. I don't mind. No one, no one goes up to you. No one looks at your resume. You have MIT mechanical engineering department, and it says, "So, did you get a real bona fide mechanical engineering degree?" <laughs> and and after fifty years of doing this, no one asks you anything about it. So. Yeah, they probably don't even care where you went to school anymore. MIT, who gives a fuck? <laughs> <laughs> How many times have you been arrested, sir? Twice? Only twice? <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> yeah. Can you fog a mirror? You're working for us. Yeah. At what point? I guess robotics doesn't exist in a vacuum, and it's sort of an amalgam of other disciplines, so mechanical, yeah. electrical, software, and then, you know, to some extent, yeah. firmware and systems engineering. Systems engineering is a big part of it. I, yeah. You I, can't really teach systems engineering in school, though. Like you, you almost need to have well, they, mechanical they've or got, electrical or software to be any good at systems engineering, which maybe is their logic. Got, they've got a division of systems engineering now or something. Um, in It's between a couple of the departments, right? So it's not a department. It's not a school. Um, and it it takes from a couple of departments. I think they've got the right approach. I tried to get a job there, but you know, I didn't have a PhD, so they wouldn't give me one. Um, Stupid. <laughs> well, yeah, I sort of bore a grudge on that one. Um, but I, 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 I'm a big fan of, I mean, it, my kids went to a technical high school in Lexington, Massachusetts here, it was Minuteman Tech. And at the time it had these things called the academies. So they had a biomed academy, an engineering academy, and uh, eco something or other, ecosystems, I think. And 
there was also a tech track that went with that. So you had the college bound kids in the academies, and then you had the matching technical school kids who were taking the, the same technical classes, just different academic classes. That's interesting. So like less <laughs> academic, more yeah. trade oriented. So the engineering academy shared the lab with the robotics techs and they learned robotics oh, cool. and they learned the engineering process. So I actually taught some classes there and was on the advisory board and I went and, you know, the engineering method and the engineering process and new product development stuff and patents and things like that. I worked with them on. And then yeah, I would. I that stuff when I was in high school. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, neither did I. Yeah. Uh. And I was on their advisory board and we were always talking about the robotics. And I was always saying, you know, you're better off teaching the kids mechatronics, systems engineering than teaching robotics. I don't like the fact that we pitch robotics, but you pitch robotics because it's popular. Kids want to get into it. And you pitch robotics because the state wants to fund it. Oh, that's interesting. So that's where you get your money. So even though we called the the department robotics and the lab robotics what we were focused on was engineering method electrical engineering mechanical engineering teaching the kids the right physics and the basics of it which is and mechatronics using, yeah and using the robotics as a vehicle for teaching them so again the, the crotchety old man in me thinks that's the right way to do it yeah i don't so disagree we'll get, so when you look at MIT, it, I still don't think they have, they teach robotics now, but they don't have a robotics department or school or degree. Um, when I was there, we asked them to put in a microprocessor course so we can learn about these newfangled things called microprocessors. And the Institute was dead set against it. Because now we teach you the fundamentals. You can pick this stuff up on your own. Huh. But so, like microprocessors are in everything now. Like that's incredibly yeah. useful. They they were, and they were getting to be everything in everything then. But we took classes in, I took classes in digital electronics, took labs in electronics. And we took a lot of classes in computer science. And back then computer science was how computers are built. Right? So it's like Here. architecture. Architecture, Boolean logic, Carnot maps, uh, structures of programming languages. Like a data structure? We did data structures. Oh, um, you're talking about like semantic structure, like, you know, how it goes together. Like registers and counters. Got and, it. And program registers and instruction registers. And this you only and really deal with registers in assembly language though, right? I mean. And we all programmed in assembler. I, I took one class and these were um, mainline double E courses, right? They weren't ME classes for double E's or, or double E classes. These were mainline double E CS classes. I took a class in I think the first computer science class, uh, we did high level programming in PL1. And Joseph Weizenbaum taught that, the guy who wrote the ELISA program, wrote a book called Computer Power and Human Reason because he didn't like where computers were going. He was the first guy to warn against AI. Well, that's interesting. So he, he was a professor at the Institute who I got to have as a teacher. And I thought it was ironic that my computer science teacher didn't trust computers. <laughs> uh, and then the second class I took, we did assembler, PDP-11 assembler. Oh, cool. Algol, Lisp, and before we did Lisp, we did Lambda Calculus. So that might have been it. PDP-11 assembler, Algol, which was our structured language, Lisp, which is Lisp. It is based on Lambda Calculus, a mathematical premise. Pretty sure there was another language in there, but I can't remember what it was. 
So in that one semester, we had a program in four different languages, four different ways. Sounds pretty familiar from getting a CS degree. Yeah, and and of course, in those days, well, in my first class, so if you were if you took the ME department programming class, you did it on punch cards, and it was a Fortran class. Yeah, that or Cobalt. Yeah, I I took the double E course, so it was uh, PL one, and we did that. We we wrote and tested our programs on Multics which was MIT's big mainframe made by Honeywell because huh. they turned IBM down. They put out bids for a mainframe, a multi-user system, and Honeywell bid on it and IBM bid on it with the 360. And MIT didn't like the 360, so they bought Multics. Well, the DOD, the DOD bought Multics and planted it at MIT. Huh. So we would sit down at the terminals, which were IBM's electric typewriters. And we would dial up Multics on a dial phone. That's interesting. And put the handset into the acoustic coupler. And we would start to type and write our programs. Wait, is the was... acoustic coupler what it sounds like? Just like a microphone and a speaker that the phone sits on? Yeah, the it's a uh, two like the, the ear cups on your headphones right now, two of those, and you took the handset and you stuck them in the acoustic coupler. That's pretty cool. And you talked, you know, the old modem sounds on telephones. Yep. Acoustic couplers, you do 110 baht with those babies. Let me tell you how it's <laughs> So I even had one. My first modem was an acoustic modem when I bought my first computer. But regardless, so we'd sit there, you dial up Multics, and you'd type things on your IBM Selectric. And if somebody in the DOD had more important work to do and you were some freshman at MIT, you, your system probably went down <laughs> while you were trying to get your homework done. <laughs> and then the next semester when I took the other class, when we did the PDP-11 stuff, it was actually on CRTs, terminals, where you, in real time, like, saw text on a screen. How did you get feedback from the IBM Selectric with the... Um, oh, you print command. Oh, inter where did it print to, if not and a CRT? It printed on your Selectric typewriter. So it was, it was actually, like, typing it out. Yeah, yeah. So an IBM Selectric, right, you know, was, was like the key typewriter of its day. It had the little golf ball and you could type. Well, they made versions I of the those. Selectric. I remember the golf they ball. They made versions of it that had a solenoid under every key. Huh. So it would be able to pull the keys and type back at you. That's, That's how it turned into a terminal. And then they put deck writers in each dorm, and a deck writer was a five by seven matrix printer made by digital equipment. And you would type on those, and it would type back at you. That's pretty cool. So anything you did on computers back then before you had CRTs was you would type something into the computer at the command line, and it would type back at you. Yeah, just like the only old movies, like in war games. That's interesting. I did not know they worked that way. Uh, we even had a teletype at the Mall Railroad Club. We had an old school teletype with a paper tape reader, and we had a PDP-11. I think it was a PDP-11. Yeah, it was PDP-11 serial number one was the story. And... We didn't use the computer to control the model railroad. We used the computer to print out the orders for the day. Because when you run a model railroad, you're actually running train orders and picking up loads and filling things. So that's what we used the PDP-11 for. That's cool. The, the railroad was run by telephone switching equipment made in the 40s. <laughs> it's 
It's probably more authentic to how a railroad actually ran, though, I would think, just because it oh, seems yeah, like a slow-to-adopt was... industry, but maybe I'm... It, no, it was the pretty, pretty spectacular stuff. We had dial phones, and you had your cabs, so you have your throttle for your train, and we could have eight operators at once, five running cabs, and three yards running. So the yards were all local. Um, so you could sit at your cab, like the cab of a train, but you're overlooking your whole railroad, and you had your phone, and you had your throttle. And you would get an order from the dispatcher, who would not be allowed to yell it to you. He would phone you. <laughs> you would pick up your phone. You would take your orders. And then you would have to assign your train to your throttle. And it was a block control system. So big railroad divided into blocks. <laughs> so you know what block you're on. So we, you would use the phone to dial in codes that would assign your throttle to a particular block. What's a block in this context? A section of track that's powered at each moment in time. I see. So the way we controlled multiple trains on the railroad was using the big telephone switching system to switch which throttle was controlling what section of track. Yeah, that makes sense. So as your train went from section to section, the system automatically carried the control with you. Yeah, and because it was electric, you needed to have the right voltage going to that block right. in order to keep the train moving the way it was right. supposed to. Right. So model railroads don't run that way anymore, but that was called the block control system. And our block controller was all telephone switching relays. Click, click, click. You could hear the thing going, click, 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 click. And there was one synchronizing relay, which we called the multi schlonker. I don't know what it's really called. Multi schlonker. That's funny. The multi schlonker was a timing relay, and, it would, and every time it ran one cycle, all the switching relays would switch at once. Oh, that's interesting. So it's so it was a synchronous system. So you'd hear yeah, it kind of function like a CPU almost. Clunk, and then and all your train controls and everything were reassigned to keep you in control so and then there were games you could play you know there are all kinds of ways to trick and, and and cheat the system like what well every locomotive drew current so that would determine the occupancy of the block so if oh you had interesting so you went through a shunt it knew you were there yeah and every caboose had conductive paint on its wheels and a resistor across the two pairs so you knew where the ass end of the train was. Huh. So you're looking you had, for that specific resistance, it sounds like, and that's how you knew. Yeah. What well, it was. just anything occupying the block, any yeah. resistance across it, right? So, um, but we had standards. So there was a standard resistor, and you had to have a caboose on your train. Or if it was a passenger train, you had to have a car that had the resistor in the back end of it. So that's how you knew how many blocks you were occupying. If you had a very long train and you occupied two blocks, the system had to always switch the two blocks with you. And it could never give up the block you just left if the caboose was still on it. So you always controlled, you were really in control of the block ahead of you you were about to gain control of it. The block your locomotive was on and anything up to the ass end of your train. Yeah, that makes sense. So there was one guy in the club who loved his really fast passenger trains. More specifically, his bud rail diesel cars. So the big bud cars, the commuter rail things that are a train and a car all in one, an engine and a car in one. Huh. I didn't know about and those. Red cars are like were like the fastest thing. They did 500 scale miles an hour. They were completely <laughs> ridiculous on the railroad. Right? So he would run his train and he, he would try to see how many blocks he could occupy before the multi schlunker came around. Oh, that's interesting. Right. So because you see the lights pop up 
each time you enter a block that you're in control of. And they don't turn off until you leave the block. And that part wasn't synchronous. It would just rising edge. Okay. Right. So the trick would be to stick a quarter on the track somewhere and make it look occupied. So he's running his train. He's all excited. And some guy slips a quarter out of his pocket, drops it on the track. <laughs> look, I got two blocks. I got three blocks. I got four blocks. I got five. All right, who put the quarter on the track? <laughs> That's funny. All, all the members of the club who weren't students, and there were very few students who were members of the club, mostly it was alumni, mostly people who worked at Digit. Oh, that's interesting. So all the PC boards on the Mall Railroad at that time all said copyright digital equipment court because <laughs> the guys would do the PC board layouts and slip them into Dex manufacturing system. Nice. Get the boards made and bring them over to the club. Yeah, it sounds like a pretty intricate mechanical computer to make all that work. And now it's all computers. Now you buy a thing called a DCC digital carrier control chip and you put it in your locomotive and the throttle is in the locomotive. It's a full H bridge controller. Yep. And you send it digital commands. So you don't have to do block control anymore, which is, so one of my, so it's always got voltage, like no matter where it's at. And then the locomotive decides what it wants to do with it. Wireless, I'm assuming, then, for how you communicate with that? Well, you use the track as the carrier. Oh, interesting. So it's like uh, Ethernet over the power lines. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and and then when the radio stuff became ubiquitous and small enough, your throttle is no longer plugged in. You can walk around carrying your throttle, which is talking to the head end of the digital control system, which is then injecting the signal onto the track. Yeah. Um, and well, the was picking it off the track. That's cool. Well, if you've got an H bridge in the locomotive, why do you need to inject a signal onto the track, though? Wouldn't you just draw voltage? Well, the signal is how you communicate with the locomotive. Oh, I see. Okay, right. So you still need right. to. Yep, got it. Yeah. yeah. Still so need that receiver. Or I guess relay. No, it's a receiver. Yeah, well, it receives from your, your handheld controller but then transmits along the track which is why right yeah transmits along the track and then every decoder knows what signal so and it's digital command so you're not transmitting like an old school servo frequency or radio controller you're you're sending digital commands down the track on the carrier and the the decoder in the train knows its address knows who the signal's intended for. Nice. So, so the track is a giant message bus. That's pretty cool. And also yeah. a power bus. Yeah. yeah. So I don't have any of that stuff. I still have old school stuff. I haven't built a railroad in years. But when I lived in Pennsylvania, I had a five scale miles of track on my model railroad. Nice. When I moved from Pennsylvania to How Massachusetts, long? all my stuff got stolen. Ah, that sucks. Yep. How long is a scale mile? Well, I was running N gauge, so that's one to one sixty more or less. Okay, so, so scale mile, one hundred sixtieth of a mile. I had. That is. See if I can remember how long the layout was. It had two eight foot legs, and a twelve foot, sixteen foot center. So a 16, 32 feet long, and the layout was essentially a double dog bone folded on itself. So it was an oval, 32 foot long oval folded on itself, so 64 foot. So there was about 150 feet of oh, main line track on it. Pretty awesome. And it was a 160 to 1 scale railroad. That sounds like fun. I, I never got into model railroads. Um, I did my first yeah. robot when I was 12. Um, and yeah. I just always. Uh, Your kids get the high tech generation. Yeah. Yeah. I just got, well, I, I got it out of a book by Mark Tilden about beam robots. And so 
Uh-huh. Mine was um, a two AA batteries with a little tap in the middle, and then it had micro lever switches and would reverse the current of whatever motor got tapped by switching where it was connected to from yeah. the one side to the other. Um, so it was pretty rudimentary, but it would like avoid obstacles and. And cool. I guess you could call that a robot. <laughs> yeah. so. Someone gave me, you know, I got too many strange gifts from people. Someone gave me a Coke can robot kit, a little science kit. It was four pieces of wire you mounted to a can of Coca-Cola, and an empty can. And so an empty soda can didn't have to be Coke, but yeah, it looks better if it's a Coke can. They're the best looking cans. <laughs> these four little pieces of piano wire on it and it had a little vibrating motor on it so it would kind of trundle around oh that's fun vibrator yeah okay that's a robot okay well the other one i saw that was similar to that is a toothbrush so apparently if you get a toothbrush where the bristles all point one way and you put a vibrating motor on it you can get it to locomate in the direction that the bristles are pointing away from. Yeah. Because yeah, they'll kind of shuffle in that direction. You can get vibratory brush conveyors. That's a thing. I did not know that. And that's exactly what that is. It's a, it's a bed of bristles, and you can move delicate objects in one direction. That's awesome. What would you want to convey with a vibratory brush conveyor? Eggs. Um, yeah. Now I wouldn't do food on a brush conveyor. I'd do metal parts. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I guess if an egg cracked on that, it would suck pretty bad. It would, yeah, and, you know, whatever's on that touching food. No, I don't want that. I don't know why people did brush conveyors. I know I had to look at them for something, but I can't even remember what part it was. And then there's good old vibratory feeders and vibratory conveyors that just vibrate. You know, the springs are designed so it vibrates in this kind of oval, so it throws the part in the air and then comes back and throws it again and throws it again and throws it again. I did not realize that's how those worked. Yeah. You've seen wall feeders, right? Yeah. Well, not, not like up close. I've looked at them for projects, but I just don't do a whole lot of industrial automation stuff. So, yeah. So bowl feeders are very cool because a there's Newtonian physics involved, right? They're throwing the part in the air and then scooting back behind the part before the part falls down. And That's pretty awesome. The the again. And the way they sort parts in a bowl feeder is just statistics. When it comes down to it, you kind of try and orient the part and get it to go somewhere. But if you watch a video of a vibratory bowl feeder, you'll see parts falling back into the bowl all the time because if you're trying to feed a part like a dime on its side odds are good that nine times out of ten the dime's on its surface Ah. so if you make a very thin ledge for the dime it'll fall back into the bowl if it's lying on its face but if it's up on edge it'll make it down the hill that's pretty cool feeders depend fantastically on probabilities. Yeah, it makes sense to they, me. And they work because, yeah, sometimes the thing's where you want it to be. And if you exclude all the other times, it then... looks like the part's always giving you something you want. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I always wondered how that managed to work. It makes sense if you have all those filters for behavior They're... you're not looking for. They are so cool. Yeah. But it's a it's a crafty art. When I started programmation in '85, uh, I intended to build a couple of different products because I worked in the robot industry, and I was contractually limited from working in the robot industry again. <laughs> I had sold robot, no, just for five years. Okay, I had sold my robot company, and and you know wasn't allowed to compete with it. So one of the things I was going to do was a smart bowl feeder. And my intention was to have a little camera and do a simple pattern match 
And if the part wasn't in the right orientation, blow it off with a jet of air. And so instead of having to fine tune all the little hurdles, you would do it with electronics. Which gets your setup time down, just like Rethink Robotics. <laughs> well, and your fabrication time down. That's a good point. <laughs> And there was a guy from MIT, Sean something or other, uh, who came up with a company called Cochlear. It was doing that with ultrasound. They were actually measuring the part with ultrasound and then blowing it off. Uh, I thought I would do it with cameras. I never built it because somebody wanted the monorail system right away. That makes sense. Never got to build that thing, but that thing was going to be my small product that would generate the cash flow for the business to do the monorail system. But since someone paid for the monorail right away, I started with that, which I always thought was a business mistake that I bit off more than I could chew at the beginning instead of the smaller thing. But surprisingly, you don't see vision based bull feeders on the market yet. Huh. And it seems to me it's kind of a no-brainer, especially now that you can build the camera and the compute for, for next to nothing. Yeah, it seems like ultrasound would be difficult to dial in for that application where vision would work a lot better. I mean, Yeah, but in the day, it was way cheaper to use ultrasound. Than yeah, camera. that makes sense. And probably like the compute was pretty challenging to get working. When was this? mid 80s okay yeah so I, I don't even know how you'd go about implementing vision in the mid 80s well it was same way as we do it now with a little ccd C, uh, ccd camera because there weren't seen last cameras yet little ccd camera but then you would just do the the simple 2d pattern matching stuff that we could do then so you know back then a vision system cost Twenty or thirty thousand dollars, but you could start getting them to run on a PC for a couple of grand. So, for five K, the thing probably could have gotten the job done. Pretty awesome. Yeah, now you can do it for, you know, a few hundred bucks. Yeah, for sure. If that even. Yeah. Is there anything you want to plug on the tail end of the podcast? Uh, there's. News going to be coming out about HDS soon enough, so there's nothing I can plug yet, but there is going to be cool things going on. Um, so this I'll is coming out know. December 17th, if that changes anything. Nah. Okay. It won't. Yeah, it's in the middle of holidays. I figure probably not. Paperwork won't be done in time. Gotcha. You get permissions, but we're going to be putting out some news. All right. Well, maybe we can do it again after that comes out. Uh, talk about it. I'll, I'll let you know when the news comes out and I'll be able to show you some things and we can share it with the viewing public. Yeah, that sounds great. Happy to promote. And and by then, football season will be over so I won't have to cry anymore. <laughs> Brutal. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again, and see you on the next one.